So, tonight's special guest storyteller is Shandon Loring with Sci-Fi Adventures. I have two stories, Blaze of Glory by Robert Silverberg. A hot-headed communications officer sacrificed himself to save his ship. But was it heroism or murder most foul? And our second story is Delivery Guaranteed by Calvin Knox. A space ferry is hired to transport museum relics from Venus to Ganymede. A light, fun, engaging space opera with shades of the cold equations. The second story is by someone named Calvin Knox. The first story is by Robert Silverberg. So what's the secret connection between Calvin Knox and Robert Silverberg? Hmm. Okay, first story. Blaze of glory. You know, they list John Murchison as one of the great heroes of space. <laughs> A brave man and true who willingly sacrificed himself to save his ship. He won his immortality on the way back from Shala, too. Yeah, one thing's wrong, though. He was brave, but he sure wasn't willing. He was not the self-sacrificing type. I'm inclined to think it was murder, or maybe execution. By remote control, you might say. Yeah, I guess they pick up spaceship crews at random, you know? Say, by yanking a handful of cards from the big computer and throwing up at the boost space roof. <laughs> the ones that stick get picked. Yeah. At least that's the only way I can possibly conceive that a man like Murchison could have been sent to Shala II in the first place. Mm. He was a spaceman of of the old school, you may say. Tall, bull-necked, coarse-featured, eh, hard-swearing. He was a, a spaceman of a type that had never existed except in story tapes for the very young, the only kind Murchison was ever likely to have viewed, and he was our chief signal officer. Now, somewhere he had picked up an awesome technical competence. Yeah. Murchison could handle any sort of communication device with supernatural ease. I once saw him tinker with a complex little Cathian artifact that had been buried for half a million years. And how that detecting the 21-centimeter hydrogen song with it meant. Now, how he knew that little widget was a star mapping device, I will never understand. A couple of Murchison's extraordinary special skill was a, um, an irascibility, a... Self-centered inner moodiness flaring into seemingly unmotivated anger at unpredictable times. And that made Murchison a prime risk on a planet like Shala too. Yeah. There was something wrong with his, his circuit breaker setup, you know? You can never tell when he'd overload, start fizzing and sparking, and blow off a couple of megawatts of temper. Yeah. You must admit this is not the ideal sort of man to send to a world whose inhabitants are listed in the E.T. catalog as wise, somewhat world-weary, exceedingly gentle, non-aggressive to an extreme degree and thus subject to exploitation. The Shawlands must be handled with great patience and forbearance and should be given the respect due one of the galaxy's elder races. Eh, yeah, well, myself, I'd never been to Shawla too, but I had a sharp mental image of the Shawlands, all right. Melancholy old men pondering the witchness of the why and ready to fall apart at the first loud voice that caught them by surprise. Yeah, the Shawlands. So it caught me by surprise when the time came to affix my handcock to the roster of the Philosophic, and I saw on the line above mine the scribbled words, Murchison, John F. Signalman, first class. Well, I signed my name, Loeb Ernest T., second officer. I picked up my pay voucher. I walked past the, somewhat dizzily. I, I was thinking of the time I had seen Murchison, John F., giving a Denobian frogman the beating of his life for no particular reason at all. All the rain here makes me sick, was all Murchison cared to say. The frogman lived, and Big John got an X on his psych report. Now he was shipping out for Shala? Eh, well, maybe so. But faith in the computer that makes up spaceship compliments was seriously shaken. Now we were the fourth or fifth expedition to Shala, too. The planet, second of seven in orbit around the brightest star in Scorpio's tail, was small and scrubby but of a great strategic importance as a lookout spot for that sector of the galaxy. The natives hadn't minded our intrusion, and so a military base had been established there after a little preliminary haggling. The Philosophic was a standard warp conversion drive ship holding 36 men. It had a crew, the usual crew of eight, plus a, a cargo of 28 of Terra's finest, being sent out as replacements for the current staff of the, the Philosophic, blasted off on the 3rd of July, 2530, a warmish day made the conversion from ion drive to warp drive as soon as we were clear of the local system and popped back into normal space three weeks later and 200 light years away. It was a routine trip in all respects. 
with the warp drive can with the warp conversion drive, and a ship is equipped to travel both long distances and short. It handles the long hops via subspace warp, and the short ones by good old standard ion drive see to the spacesuit navigating. Yeah, it's a good system. And then extra mass that double drive requires is more than compensated for by the saving in time and maneuverability. Now, the warp drive part of the ship was pre-plotted and just about uh, pre-traveled for us. There was no headaches there. But when we burped back into the continuum about a half a light year from Shalov, a human factor entered into the situation. By the human factor, I mean Murchison, of course. It was Murchison's job to check and tend the network of telemetering systems that acted as the ship's eyes to make sure the mass detectors were operating to smooth the bugs out of the communications channel between navigator and captain and drive deck. In brief, <clears throat> he was the man who made it possible for us to land. Every ship carried a spare signalman, just in case. In normal circumstances, the spare never got much work. When the time came for landing, Captain Knight buzzed me and told me to start lining up the men who would take part, and I signaled Murchison first. His voice is a low, rasping drawl. Yeah? Uh, Second Officer Loeb, prepare for landing double fast, Navigator. Heinrichs has the uh, chart set up for you, and he's waiting for your call. There was a pause, and then... Nah, I don't feel like it, Loeb. It was my turn to pause. I shut my eyes, held my breath, and counted to three by fractions. Then I said, Would you mind repeating that, Sigelman Murchison? Yes, sir. No, sir. I mean, oh, hell, Loeb, I'm fixing something. Why do you want to land right now for? Uh, Murchison, I don't make up the schedules. Then who in the blazes does? Tell him I'm busy. I turned down my phone's volume. Busy doing what, Murchison? Busy doing nothing. Get off the line. I'll call Heinrichs. I saw, sighed and broke contact. He'd just been ragging on me. Once again, Murchison had been ornery for the sheer sake of being ornery. One of these days, he's going to refuse to handle the landing entirely. And that day, I told myself, the day will crate him up and shove him through the disposal lock. Now, Murchison was a little island there. He had his own skills, and he applied them when he felt like it, and if he felt like it. But only when he believed that he, Murchison himself, would profit from it. He never did anything unwillingly, because if he couldn't find it in himself to do it willingly, he wouldn't do it at all. It was impossible to make Murchison do something. Unwisely, and I don't know why, but we all tolerated it. But someday, yeah, Murchison would get a captain who didn't understand him, and he'd be slapped with a sentence of mutiny during a fit of temperament. And for his sake, I hope not. The penalty for mutiny in space is death. With Murchison's cooperation gratefully accepted, we targeted on Shala II, which was then at Perihelion, and we orbited it. Down in his little cubicle, Murchison worked like a little demon, taking charge of the ship's landing system in a tremendous way. Now, don't get me wrong, Murchison was a fantastic signalman when he wanted to be. Later that day, the spinning red ball that was Shala II hung just of ahead of us, close enough to let us see the three blobs of continents and the big choppy hydrocarbon ocean that licked them smooth. The Terran base on Continent 3 beamed as a landing guide, and Murchison picked it up, fed it through the computer bank to Navigator Henricks, and we homed in for the landing. The Terran base consisted of a couple of blockhouses, a sprawling barracks, and a good-sized radar parabola, all set in a ring out on an almost mathematically flat plain. Yeah, Charlotte, too, is a great world for planes, Columbus would have had the devil's time convincing people this world was round. Murchison guided us to a glossy-looking area not far from the base we touched down. The Thelicific creaked and groaned a little as the landing jacks absorbed its weight. Green lights went on all over the ship. We were free to go outside. And a welcoming uh, committee was on hand, eight members of the base staff clad in shorts and topies. Regulation uniforms went by the board on oven-hot Shala, too. The eight looked awfully happy to see us. Coming over the flat, sandy plain from the base were a dozen or so others, and running behind them I could see even more. They were understandably glad we were here. You get, get you, Twenty-eight of them had spent a full year on Sol at Shala, too, and they were eligible for their parody program this year's vacation, you know. There were some other things moving towards us. I say... Things, not out of disrespect, but just out of accuracy. <clears throat> they moved slowly, with grace and dignity. I'd expected to be impressed with the Shawlins, and well, I was. 
They were erect bipeds, about four feet tall, with long, thin arms dangling to their knees. Their gray skins were grainy and rough, and their dark eyes, they had three, ranged triangularly, were deep-set and brooding. A fleshy sort of cow, or a, a cobra hood, curled up from their necks to shield their round, hairless skulls. The aliens were six in number, and the youngest looking at them seemed ancient. A brown-faced young man wearing shorts, topi, and tattooed star stepped forward and said, I'm General Gloucester. I'm in charge here. The captain acknowledged his greeting. Uh, Knight of the Philosophic, we have your relief men with us. Wash for us, oh, hope you do. <laughs> be kind of silly to come all this way without them, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, we laughed over that a little. By now we were ringed in by at least 50 Earthmen. Probably the entire base complement. We didn't rotate the entire base staff at once, of course. And the six aliens. The 28 kids we had ferried here were looking around the place, curiously apprehensive about this hot, dry, flat planet that would be their home for the next sidereal year. The crew of the Philosophic had gathered in a little knot near the ship. Most of them probably felt the way I did. They were glad we'd be on our way home in a couple of days. Murchison was squinting at the six aliens. I wondered what he was thinking about. The bunch of us uh, would traipse back the half mile or so of the settlement. Gloucester walked with Knight and myself, prattling volubly about the progress the base was making. The 28 newcomers mingled with the 28 who were being relieved. Murchison walked by himself, kicking up puffs of red dust and scowling in his usual manner. The six aliens accompanied us at some distance. <clears throat> yeah, we keep building all the time here, Gloucester explained when we were within the compound. Branching out, you know, setting up new equipment, shoring up the old stuff. That radar parabola there wasn't up the last replacement trip. I looked up. Your yeah, place looks fine, General. It was strange calling a man half my age General. But the service you know, sometimes works out that way. When do you plan to have your telescope set up? Oh, yeah, you know, next year, maybe. He glanced out the window at the featureless landscape. We keep building all the time. It's the best way to stay sane on this world. Well, how about the natives? The captain asked. You have much contact with them? Gloucester shrugged. As much as they'll allow. They're a proud old race, pretty near dried up and dead now, just a handful of them left. Oh, but what a race they must have been once. What minds, what culture. I found Gloucester's boyish enthusiasm discomforting. Um, you think we can meet one of the aliens before we go? I asked. Well, well uh, yeah, I'll see about it. Gloucester picked up a phone. McHenry, are there any natives in the compound now? Well, yeah, good. Send them up here, will you? Moments later, one of the shorts-clad men appeared hand-in-hand hand with an alien. Now, at close range, the shawl looked almost frighteningly old. A maze of wrinkles gullied his noseless face, running the triple optics down to dots of nostrils to the sagging, heavy-lipped mouth. This is Asga, Gloucester said. Asga, meet Captain Knight and uh, Second Officer Loeb, the Philosophic. The creature had offered a wobbly sort of curtsy and said in a deep, resonant, almost human croak, I am very humble indeed in your presence, Captain Knight, and our second officer, Loeb. Asker came out of the curtsy and three eyes fixed on mine. I felt like squirming, but I stared back. It was like looking into a mirror that gave the wrong reflection. Yet I enjoyed my proximity to the alien. There was something calm and wise and good about this grotesque little creature, something relaxing and terribly fragile in it. The rough gray skin looked like Precious leather, and the hood over the skull appeared to shield it from worry and harm. A faint, musty odor wandered through the room. We looked at each other, Knight, Gloucester, McHenry, and, and I, and we remained silent. Now that the Shawlin was here, what could we say? What new thing could we possibly tell this ancient creature? I resisted an impulse to kneel before him. I was fumbling for words to express my emotion when the sharp buzz of the phone cut across the room. Gloucester nodded curtly to McHenry, who answered. The man listened for a moment. Oh, uh, Captain Knight, it's for you. Puzzled, Knight took the receiver. He held it long enough to hear about three sentences and turned to me. Loeb, get a land car from someone in the compound and get back to the ship. Murchison's carrying on with one of the aliens. So I, uh, hot-footed it in the compound. I spotted an enlisted man tooling up his land car. I I pulled rank on him, and I requisitioned it. And minutes later, I was parking outside the fellow Civic and was clambering hand over hand up the catwalk. 
an excited looking recruit stood in the open airlock. Where's Murchison? I asked. He's down in the ca- he, in the communicator's cabin. He he got an alien in there with him. He, there's gonna be there's gonna be trouble. Yeah, I remember Denovila. The Murchison kicking the stuffings out of that groaning frog man. I groaned a little myself and I dashed down the companionway. The communications cabin was Murchison's um sanctum sanctorum, if you will. Uh, a cubicle off the astro deck where he worked and kept control over a philosophic communications network. I yanked open the door and I saw Murchison at the far end of the cabin holding a massive crescent wrench and glaring at a shawlin facing him. The shawlin had his back to me. I looked small and squat and helpless. Murchison saw me as I entered. Get out of here, Lobe. This ain't none of your affair. What's going on here? I snapped. This alien snooping around he was. I'm going to let him have it with the wrench. <laughs> I meant no harm. I meant no harm, the alien boomed sadly. Mere philosophical interest in your strange machines, nothing more. I have offended a folkway of yours. I, I humbly apologize. It, it is not the way of my people to give offense. I walked forward. I took a position between the two of them, making sure I wasn't within easy reach of Murchison's wrench. He was standing there with his nostrils spread, his eyes cold and hard, his breath pumping noisily. Murchison was angry. And an angry Murchison was a frightening sight indeed. He took two heavy steps towards me. I told you, get out. This is my cabin, Lobe. And neither you nor any aliens got no business in it. Put down the wrench, Murchison. That's an order. He laughed contemptuously. <laughs> yeah, a signalman first class don't have to take orders from anyone but the captain if he thinks the ship's safety is in danger and jeopardized. And I do. I think we're right dangerous, full enough. There's a dangerous alien in here. Be reasonable. This Shawlin's not dangerous. He just wanted to look around, just curious. The wrench wiggled warningly. I wish I had a blaster with me, but I hadn't thought of bringing a weapon. The alien faced Murchison quite complacently, as if confident the signalman would never strike anything so old and delicate as he was. Uh, you better leave, I said to the alien. No! Murchison roared. He shoved me to one side and went after the Shawlin. The alien stood there, waiting as Murchison came on. I tried to drag the big man away, but there was no stopping him. Well, at least he didn't use the wrench. He let the big crescent slip clangingly to the floor and slapped the alien open-handed across its face. The Shawlin backed up a few feet. A trickle of bluish fluid worked its way along its mouth. Murchison raised his hand again. You damn snooper! I'll teach you to poke in my cabin! And he hit the alien again. This time the Shawlin folded up accordion-wise and huddled on the floor. It focused those three deep, solid black eyes on Murchison reproachfully. Murchison looked back. They stared at each other for a long time, until it seemed their eyes were linked by an invisible cord. And then Murchison looked away. Yeah. Get out of here. Hmm. <laughs> he muttered at the alien, and the Shawlin rose and departed, limping a little but still intact. Those aliens were more solid than they seemed to look. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're going to put me in the brig now, huh? Murchison said to me. Okay, I'll go quietly. Yeah, we didn't brig him, though. There was nothing to be gained by that. I had seen the explosion coming right from the start. When you drop a, drop a lighted match in a tub of hydrazine, you don't punish the hydrazine for blowing up, and Murchison couldn't be blamed for what he did, either. He got the silent treatment instead. The men at the base would have had nothing to do with him whatsoever, and because in their year on Shawla, they had developed a respect for the aliens, you see, not far from worship, and any man who would actually use physical violence, well, he just wasn't worth wasting breath on. The men of our crew gave him a wide berth, too. He wandered among us, a tall, powerful figure with anger and loneliness stamped on his face, and he said nothing to any of us, and no one said anything to him. Whenever he saw one of the aliens, he went out far out of his way to avoid a meeting. Murchison got another X on his psych report, and that second X meant he would never be allowed to visit any world inhabited by intelligent life again. It was a boost space regulation, one of the many they have for the purpose of locking the barn door too late. Yeah, yeah. Three days we went by this, this way on Shala. On the 4th, we took aboard the 28 departing men. We said goodbye to Gloucester and his staff, and the 28 we had ferried out to him, and somewhat guiltily, goodbye to the Shawlins, too. The six of them showed up on for our blast-off, including the somewhat battered one who had had the run-in with Murchison. They wished us well, gravely, without any sign of bitterness. 
For the hundredth time, I was astonished by their patience, their wisdom, their understanding. I held Asga's rough old hand in mine, and I said goodbye, and I, I told him for the first time what I'd been wanting to say since our first meeting, how much I hoped we'd eventually reach the mental equilibrium and inner calm of the Shawlins. <clears throat> and the little old fellow smiled warmly at me, and I said goodbye again and ended the ship. We ran the usual pre-blast, pre-flight checkups, and we got ready for the departure. Everything was working well. Murchison had none of his usual grumbles and complaints, and we were off the ground in record time. So a couple of days of ion drive, three weeks of warp, two more of ion drive acceleration, we'd all be back on Earth. <clears throat> the three weeks passed slowly, though, of course, and when Earth lies ahead of you, time drags. But after the interminable grayness of warp came the sudden wrenching twist and the bright, slippery um, sliding feeling as our bowling generator threw us back into ordinary space. I pushed down the communicator and stood near my arm, and I heard the voice of Navigator Heinrich saying, Murchison, give me the coordinates, will you? Hold on, came Murchison growl. Patience, Sam, you'll get your coordinates as soon as I got them. There was a pause, and Captain Knight said, Murchison, what's holding up those coordinates, man? Where are we, anyway? Turn on the visit plates. Ah, please, Captain. Murchison's heavy voice was surprisingly polite, then he ruined it. Please be good enough to shut up and let a man think. Murchison! Knight sputtered and stopped. We all knew one solid fact about our signal. When he did as he pleased, no one but no one coerced him into anything. No one puts Murchison in a corner. So we waited, spinning end over end somewhere in the vicinity of Earth, completely blind behind our wall of metal, until Murchison chose to feed us some data we had no way of bringing the ship down, let alone know where we were. Three more minutes went by that way, and then private circuit. Knight uses when uh, he wants to talk to me alone, lit up, and he said, Bob, get your butt down to communication. See what's holding that. Hold the Murchison up. We can't stay here forever. Yes, sir. I pocketed a blaster this time. I hate making mistakes more than once. I left my cabin. I walked numbly to the companionway. I turned to the left, hit the drop hatch, and I found myself outside Murchison's door. I knocked. Get away from here, Loeb! Murchison bellowed from within. I'd forgotten he'd rigged in a one-way vision circuit outside his door. Let me in, Murchison. Let me in or I'll come in a blasting. <sighs> come on in, then. Nervously, I pushed the door open. I poked my head up and the blaster snout in, half expecting Murchison to leap on me from above. But he was sitting at an equipment jam desk, scribbling notes, which surprised me. I stood waiting for him to look up. And finally, he did. I gasped when I saw his face. Drawn, harried, pale, tense. I'd never been, never seen an expression like that on Murchison's face before. What's, uh, what's going on, Murchison? We're all waiting to get moving, and, uh, he turned his face to me squarely. You want to know what's going on, Job? Well, listen, this is what's going on. The ship's blind, all right? None of the equipment's reading anything. No telemeter pickup, no visuals, no nothing, man. You scrape up some coordinates if you can. We held a little meeting half an hour later in the ship's common room. Murchison was there, and Knight, and myself, and Navigator Heinrich, and three representatives of the cargo. How did this happen? Captain Knight demanded. Murchison shrugged. It happened while we were in warp. We passed through something, I don't know, a magnetic field, maybe. An EMP thing, yeah, you know, and we bollocked every instrument we have. Knight glanced at Heinrichs. You ever hear such a thing happening before? He seemed to suspect Murchison of some kind of funny business. Lennox shook his head. No, Chief. And there's a good reason why, too. If this happens to a ship, what's happened to us? I'll tell you what, the ship doesn't get back to tell nobody about it. He was right. With no contact at all with the outside, no information on location or orbits, there was no way to land this ship. And the radio, of course, was dead, too. We couldn't even call for help. Captain Knight looked gray-faced and very old. He asked worriedly, well, What could have caused this thing? Yeah, no one knows what subspace conditions are like, Henrik said. Might have been a fluke magnetic field, if Murchison suggests, or anything at all, an alien entity that swallowed our antenna for all we know. The question is not what did it, Captain, it's how do we get back? Uh, good point. Murchison, is there any way you can repair these instruments? No. 
What, just like that flat? No, hell, man, you've, I've, I've seen you do wonders with instruments on the blink before. No, Murchison repeated solidly. I tried. I can't do a damned thing. No. <sighs> that means we're finished, doesn't it? Asked Ramirez, one of our returnees, his voice a little wild. We might just as well have stayed on Shola. At least we'd still be alive. It looks pretty lousy, Hendricks admitted. The thin-faced navigator was frowning blackly. We don't dare try a blind landing. There's nothing we can do. Nothing at all. Ah. There's one thing, Murchison said. All eyes turned to him. What's that, Murchison? Knight asked. You put a man in a spacesuit and you anchor him to the skin of the ship. You have him guide us in by verbal instructions. It's a way, anyway. <laughs> Pretty far-fetched, Henrys commented. Yeah, damn it, but it's our only hope, Murchison snapped. Stick a man up there and you let him talk us in. Why, he'd incinerate once we hit the Earth's atmosphere. We'd lose a man, we'd still have to land blind. Murchison puckered his thick lower lip. You'll be able to judge the ship's height by hole temperature once you got that close. Besides, once the ship's inside the ionosphere, you can use ordinary radio for the rest of the way down. The trick is to get that far. Yeah, well, I think it's worth a try, Captain Knight said. I guess we'll have to draw lots, otherwise we're all going to die right here. Lobe, get some straws from the galley. Never mind that, Murchison said. What? I said never mind. Skip it. Forget about drawing straws. I'll go. Murchison, skip it. It's a failure in my department, in it? So I'm going to go out there. I volunteer, get it? If anyone else wants to volunteer, I'll match him for it. He looked around at us. No one moved. If I don't hear no take us, I'll assume the job's mine. Sweat streamed down his face. There was a startled silence, broken when Ramirez made the lousiest remark I ever heard a mortal man utter. You're trying to make up for hitting that defenseless shawl in, eh, Murchison? Now you want to be a hero to even things up or something, huh? I'll tell you, if Murchison had killed him on that spot, Ramirez, right then, I don't, I, I think we'd all have applauded. But the big man only turned to Ramirez and said quietly, You're just as blind as the others, Ramirez. You don't know how rotten those defenseless Shawlins are. None of you do. None of you know what they did to me. You all make me sick. I'm going out there. Murchison turned and walked away, out to get into his spacesuit and climb into the ship's skin. Murchison's explicit instructions relayed from the outside of the ship, allowing Henriks to bring us in. It was quite a feat of teamwork. At 50,000 feet above the Earth, Murchison's voice suddenly cut out. We were able to pick up a grounded ship radio by then, and we taxied down. Later, they told us it seemed like a blazing candle was riding the ship's back. A bright, clear flame flared for a moment as we cleaved the atmosphere. And I remember the look on Murchison's face as he left us to go out there. It was tense, bitter, strained. It was as if we were it was as if he were being compelled to go outside. As if he had no choice but volunteering for martyrdom. Eh I often wonder about that now. <laughs> no one ever made Murchison do anything he didn't want to do. Till then at least. We think of the Shawlins as gentle. Meek, defenseless. Murchison crossed one of them, and he died. Gentle, meek, yes, but defenseless? Meh. Murchison didn't think so. I don't know. Hell, maybe they whammy the ship and cursed Murchison with the urge to self-martyrdom to punish him. Maybe. He never did trust them much. Sort of tarnishes uh, his glorious halo, doesn't it? But you know, sometimes I think Murchison was right about those Shawlins after all. Oh, that's um, Blaze of Glory. That was darn Shawlins. Now, our next one is by uh, called Delivery Guaranteed by Calvin Knox. You know, there aren't very many freelance space ferry operators who can claim they carried a log cabin halfway from Mars to Ganymede and then have the log cabin carry them the rest of the way. <laughs> I can. Though you can bet your last tarnished megabuck I didn't do it willingly. It was quite a trip. I left Mars not only with a log cabin on board, but a genuine muzzle-loading antique cannon, a goodly supply of cannonballs therefrom, and various other miscellaneous antiques, as well as the curator of historical collections from the Ganymede Museum. 
It was also a stowaway on board, much to his surprise and mine, and he was not listed in the cargo vouchers. Now, let me make one thing clear here. I was not keen on carrying any such cargo, but my freelance ferry operator's charter is quite explicit that way, unfortunately. A ferry operator is required to hire a ship to any person of law-abiding character who meet with the government fixed rates and whose cargo to be transported neither exceeds the ship's weight allowance nor is considered contraband by any system law. In short, I'm available to just about all comers. By the terms of my charter, I've been compelled to ferry 500 marmosets to Pluto. I've been forced to haul 10 tons of Anusian guano to Callisto. I've been constrained to deliver 50 crates of fertilized frog's eggs from Earth to a research station orbiting Neptune. In the latter case of them frog eggs, I made the trip twice for the same fee thanks to our delivery guarantee clause in the contract. You see, the first time out, my radiation shield slipped up for a few seconds, not causing me any particular genetic hardships, but you know, playing merry hell with those frog's eggs. And when a bunch of four-headed tadpoles began to hatch, they served notice on me they were not accepting delivery and would pay no fee, and what's more, would sue if I didn't bring another load of potential frogs up from Earth and be damned well careful about shielding them this time. So I hauled another 50 crates of frog's eggs, this time without mishap, and I collected my fee. But I've never been happy about carrying livestock again. Now, the new offer wasn't livestock. I got the call while I was uh, laying over on Mars after a trip up from Luna with a few colonists in their gear. I had submitted my name to the transport registry, informing them that I was on call and waiting for employment. They see, I was in no hurry. I still had a couple hundred megabucks left in the last job, and I didn't mind a vacation. The call came on the third day of my Martian layover. Collect call from Mr. Sam Diamond from the transport registry. Do you accept? Yeah, I muttered, and 30000 more was chalked up to my phone bill. A dollar doesn't hardly last any time at all these days in this system-wide hyperinflation. Sam, a deep voice said. It was Mike Cooper, the transport people. Well, who else will be at this end of your collect call? And why can't you people pay for a phone call once in a while? You know the law, Sam. I've got a job for you. That's nice. Another large load of marmosets? <laughs> well, nothing live this time, Sam. Except your passenger. She's Miss Vanderweg of the Ganymede Museum. Curator of historical collections. And uh, she wants someone to ferry her back to Ganymede with some historical relics she's picked up along the way. What, the Washington Monument, the Great Pyramid of Khufu, we could tow it alongside the ship, lash down with twine? <laughs> Knock it off, Cooper said, unamused. What she's got of souvenirs of the Venusian insurrection, the log cabin that served as McIntyre's headquarters, the cannon used to drive back the blue coats and a few smaller knickknacks along those lines. Hold it, I said. You can't fit a log cabin into my ship, and if it's going to be a tow job, I want the delivery guarantee clause stricken out of the contract. How much does the damn cannon weigh? I've got a weight ceiling, you know. Yeah, I know. Her entire cargo is less than eight tons, cannon and all. It's well within your tonnage restrictions, and as for the log cabin, it doesn't need to be towed. She's agreed to take it apart for shipping and reassemble it when it gets to Ganymede. Ah, well. Layover had been nice while it lasted. Well, I was looking for some rest. Mike, isn't there some angle I can use to wiggle out of this one? None. There is not. But there is not another free fairy in town tonight. She wants to leave tonight. So you're the boy, Sam. The job's yours. I opened my mouth. I closed it again. The fairies are considered public services under the law. The only way I could get a vacation was... Sure, to last was to apply for one in advance, and I hadn't done that. All right, all right. When, where do I sign the contract? Miss Vanderweg is at my office right now. How soon can you get here? Now, I was in a surly mood as I rode downtown to Cooper's place. For the thousandth time, I resented the casual way he could pluck me out of some relaxation and make me take on a job. I wasn't looking forward to catering to the whims of some dried up old museum curator all the way to Ganymede and I wasn't too pleased with the notion of carrying relics of a Venusian insurrection, neither. Yeah, the insurrection. Yeah, that caused quite a fuss a hundred years back. A bunch of colonists on Venus decided they didn't like Earth's rule, the taxation without representation bit, you know, that their squawk was unjustified. And they set up a wildcat independent government and improvising their equipment out of whatever they could grab, dumping a bunch of tea here and there. <laughs> a chap named McIntyre was in charge. 
The insurrection is holed up in the jungle and held off the attacking loyalists for a couple of weeks. And then the Venusian local government appealed to Earth. A regiment of blue coats was shipped to Venus. And inside of a week, McIntyre was a prisoner and the insurrection ended. Yeah, but you know, those Venus, those Venus people, man. Some of them diehard Venusians still venerated the insurrections. And there had been a few murders and ambushes every year since the overthrow of McIntyre. Yeah, I could have done without carrying Venusian cargo. I was going to say as much to Cooper, too, in hopes of some clause in my charter to get me out of the assignment and back on vacation, but I didn't get the chance. See, I went storming into Cooper's office, and there was... Yeah, there was this girl sitting in the chair to the left of his desk. She was about 25, well-built in most every possible way, with glossy, short-cropped hair and an attractive face. Cooper stood up and said, Sam, I'd like you to meet Miss Erna Vanderwig of Ganymede. Miss Vanderwig, this is Sam Diamond. One of the best ferrymen there is. He'll get you to Ganymede in style. Oh, I'm sure of that, she said, smiling. Oh, ho hello, I, I said, gulping. I didn't bother raising a fuss about the political implications of my cargo. I didn't grouse about the weight limit, space problems aboard the ship, accommodation difficulties, or anything else. I reached for the contract. It was a standard printed form with the variables typed in by Cooper, and I signed it. I'd like to leave tonight, she said. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, my ship's at the spaceport. Can you um, have your cargo delivered there by, oh, say, 1,700 hours? That way we could um, blast off by 2,100. I'll try. Will you be able to help me get my goods out of storage and down to the spaceport? I started to say I'd be delighted to, but Cooper cut in sharply as I knew he would. I'm sorry, Miss Vanderway, but Sam's uh, contract charter prohibits him from any landside cargo handling except within the actual bounds of his spaceport, you see. You'll have to use a local carrier for getting your stuff to the ship, I'm afraid. If you want me to, I'll arrange for transportation for you. Now, my mood was considerably different as I returned to the demos to check out. My tub would need five days for the journey between Mars and Ganymede. <clears throat> now, conditions aboard my ship allow for a certain amount of passenger privacy. But not a devil of a lot. Log cabin or no log cabin, I was going to enjoy the proximity of this Miss Erna Vanderwig. I could think of worse troubles than having to spend five days in the same small ferry with her and only a log cabin and a cannon for chaperone. I was grinning as I walked over to the desk to let them know I was pulling out. Nat, the desk clerk, interpreted the grin logically enough but wrongly. Ah, you talked about it giving you a job, eh, Sam? How'd you work it, huh? <laughs> huh? Uh, oh, yeah, no, Nate, I took the job. I'm checking out of here at 1800. You took it? Well, you look happy, man. I am happy, I said with a mysterious expression. I started to saunter away, but Nat called me back. Hey, uh, you had a visitor a little while ago, Mr. Cooper. He wanted to let me, uh, want me to let you into your room to wait for you, but naturally I wouldn't do that. A visitor? Did he say uh, leave his name? Well, he's still here, sitting right over there next to the potted palm tree. Frowned and I walked over toward him. He was a thin, hunched up little man with a sallow look of a Venusian colonist. He was busily reading some cheap dime novel sort of magazine as I approached. Hello, well, I'm Sam Diamond. You want to see me? You're ferrying Erna Vanderway to Ganymede tonight, aren't you? His voice was thinly whining, uh, nasty sounding, mean. Uh, I make a practice of keeping my business to myself, I told him. If you're interested in hiring a ferry, you'd better go to the transport registry. I'm booked. Oh, I know you're booked, and I know who you're carrying, and I know what you're carrying. Look here, friend, I... You're carrying General McIntyre's cabin and other priceless relics of the Venusian Republic, and they're all stolen goods. His eyes had a fanatic gleam about them. I realized who he was as soon as he used the expression Venusian Republic. Only an insurrectionist sympathizer would, re would refer to the rebel group that way. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to discuss my business affairs with you, I said. My cargo has been officially cleared. It was stolen by that woman, purchased with filthy dollars and taken from Venus by stealth. I started to walk away. I hate having some loud math fanatic rant at me. But he followed, clutching at my elbows and said in his best conspiratorial tone, I warn you, Diamond, you cancel that contract or you'll suffer. Those relics must return to Venus. Whirling around, I disengaged his hands from my arm and snapped, I couldn't cancel the contract if I wanted to, and I don't want to. Get out of here, or I'll have you jugged, whoever you are. Hey, remember the warning. Go on. Shoot. Scat. He slinked out of the lobby. 
I was shaking my hand, I went upstairs to pack. Damn the idiotic cloak and dagger morons, I thought, creeping around, hissing warnings and leaving threatening notes, and in general trying to keep alive an underground movement that never had any real reason for existing from the start. It wasn't as if the earth it wasn't as if Earth had oppressed the Venusian colonists. The benefits flowed all in one direction, from Earth to Venus, and everyone on Venus knew it except for McIntyre's little band of ultra nationalistic glory hounds. Nobody on Venus wanted independence less than the colonists themselves, who had dandy tax exemptions and benefits from the mother world. Eh, I forgot all about the threats by the time I was through packing my meager belongings and I grabbed a meal at the hotel restaurant. Around 1,800 hours, I went down to the spaceport to see what's happening there. The mechanics had already wheeled my ferry out of the storage hangar, and she was out on the field getting checked over for blast-off. Erna Vanderweg and her cargo had arrived, too. She was standing at the edge of the field, supervising the unloading of her stuff from a van of local carrier. The log cabin had been taken apart. It consisted of a stack of stout logs, the longest of them some 16 feet long, and the rest tapering down. <laughs> you think you're going to be able to put that cabin back the way it was? Oh, certainly. I've got each log numbered to correspond with a diagram I've made. Here, see? The reassembling shouldn't be any trouble at all. She smiled sweetly at me. I had the other stuff, several crates, a few smaller packages, and a cannon, not very big. I say, uh, where'd you get all these things? I asked her. She shrugged prettily. Oh, I bought them on Venus. Most of them were property of descendants of the insurrectionists. They were quite happy to sell. There weren't any ferries available on Venus, so I, I took the commercial liner on the shuttle from Venus to Mars. They said I'd be able to get a ferry here. <laughs> and you did. In five days, you'll be landing in Ganymede. Oh, I can't wait to get there, to set up my exhibit. A friend. Um, <clears throat> tell me something, Miss Vanderweg. Just uh, how did you manage to uh, uh, make such an early start in the museum business? She grinned at me. Oh, my father and grandfather were museum curators, you see. I just come by it naturally, I suppose. And I was just about the only colonist on Ganymede who was halfway interested in having the job. I chuckled softly and said, <laughs> Yeah, when Cooper told me I was ferrying a museum curator, I I pictured a dried-up old spinster who had nagged me all the way again. I mean, I, I couldn't have been wronger. You disappointed? Uh, not very much, I said. Uh, we had the ship loaded inside of an hour, and everything moves and stowed neatly away in the hold, and Miss Vanderweg's personal luggage strapped down in the passenger compartment. Since there wasn't any reason for hanging around longer, I recomputed my takeoff orbit, and I called the control center for authorization to blast off at twenty hundred hours, an hour ahead of schedule. They were agreeable, and at 1955 hours, the field sirens started to scream, warning people of an impending blast. Miss Vanderwig, Erna, was aft in her acceleration cradle, as I jabbed the keys that would activate the autopilot and take us up. I started to punch the keys. The computer board started to click. There was nothing left for me to do but strap myself in and wait for the wrenchless. A blast off from Mars is no great problem in astronautics. As the automatic took over, I flipped back and flipped my seat back, converting it into an acceleration cradle. I relaxed. It seemed to me that the takeoff was a little on the bumpy side somehow. I'm like, I don't know, as if I'd figured the ship's mass wrong by one or two hundred pounds. But I didn't worry about the discrepancy. I just shut my eyes and I waited for the extra G's to bore me down on me. Now, the sanest thing for a man to do during blast off is just go to sleep. And that's what I did. <clears throat> yeah. But I woke up half an hour later or so to discover the engines had cut out. Oh, well, the ship was safely in flight and that a bloody. that and a bloody figured. <laughs> Oh, the ship was safely in flight, and that a bloody battered figure was bent over the controls, energetically ruining them with a crowbar and shears. I blinked. Then the fog on my head cleared, and I got out of my cradle. The stowaway turned around. He was quite a mess. The capillaries of his face had popped during the brief moments of top acceleration, and the fine purplish lines now wriggled across his cheeks and nose, giving him a grade-A rum blossom and the bloodshot eyes to go with it. He had some choice biz bruises that he must have acquired while rattling around during blast off, and his nose had been bleeding all over his shirt. Eh, stowaway, all right. It was the little Venusian fanatic who had threatened me at the hotel. How the hell did you get aboard? He slipped through security checkers. 
but the ship took off ahead of schedule. I did not expect to be on board when the blast-off came. Yeah, well, sorry to have fouled up your plans, I told him. But I regained consciousness in time. Your ship is ruined. You refuse to heed my warnings, and now you will never reach Ganymede alive. Ah! So perish all the enemies of the Venusian Republic. So perish those who desecrate our noble shrine. He was practically foaming at the mouth. I started toward him. He swung the crowbar and might have bashed my head in if he hadn't known how to handle himself under no grav conditions, but he didn't. And the only result of his exertion was to send himself drifting toward the roof of the cabin. I yanked on his leg as it went past and dragged him down. The crowbar dropped from his numb hand. I caught it and poked him across the head with it. Now there isn't any hesitation in a spaceman's mind when he finds a stowaway. Fuel is a precious thing. So is air and food. Stowaways simply are not allowed to live. I didn't feel any qualms about what I did next, but all the same I was glad that Erna Vanderweg wasn't awake and watching me while I went about it. <clears throat> I slipped into my breathing helmet and I sealed off the cabin. Opening the airlock, I carried the unconscious Venusian out the hatch and I gave him a good push, imparting enough momentum to send him out into an orbit of his own. The compensating reaction pushed me back into the airlock. I closed the hatch. The Venusian must have died instantly without ever knowing what was happening to him. And then I had a look-see around to determine just how much damage the stowaway had been able to do before I woke up and caught him. Eh, it was plenty. All our communication equipment was gone, but permanently. The radio was a gutted ruin. The computer was smashed. Two auxiliary fuel tanks had been jettisoned. We were hopelessly off course in an asteroid country, and the odds of reaching Ganymede looked mighty slim. By the time I finished making course corrections, we'd been down to our reserve fuel supply. Ganymede was about 350 million miles ahead of us. I, I didn't see how we were going to travel more than a tenth that distance before air and food trouble set in, and we weren't carrying enough fuel now for a safe landing, even if we'd lived to reach Ganymede. Yeah, well, it was time to wake Miss Vanderwick and tell her the news, I figured. She was lying curled up tight in her acceleration cradle, asleep with a childlike, trusting expression on her face. I watched her for perhaps five minutes before I woke her. She sat up immediately. <clears throat> well... What? Oh, is everything all right? Did we make a good blast off? <laughs> yeah, fine blast off, I said. But everything is not all right. I told her about the stowaway and how thoroughly he had wrecked us. Oh, that horrible little man from Venus. I knew he had followed me to Mars. That's why I wanted to leave for Ganymede so soon. Oh, he made all sorts of absurd threats, as if, as if the things I had bought were holy relics. Well, they are, in a way. If you worship McIntyre and his fellow rebels, then the stuff you carried away is the equivalent of the true cross, I suppose. I'm so sorry I got you into this, Sam. I shrugged. Nah, hell, it's my own fault. Your Venusian friend approached me at the hotel this afternoon and warned me off, but I didn't listen to him. I had my chance to pull out. Well, where's the stowaway now? Unconscious? I shook my head, jerking my thumb toward the single port in her cabin. He's, uh, out there. Without a suit. Stowaways aren't entitled to charity under the space laws. Oh, she said quietly, turning pale. I see. You you rejected him. I nodded. Then to get off what promised to be an unpleasant topic, I said, We're in real trouble here. We're off course. We don't have enough fuel for making corrections, and not without jettisoning everything on board, ourselves included. Well, <clears throat> I don't mind if the cargo goes, Sam. I mean... I'd hate to lose it, but if you have to dump it... Huh? Now, the ship itself is the bulk of our mass. The problem isn't the cargo. If there were only some way of jettisoning the ship. <laughs> yeah. My mouth sagged open. No. No, I thought it wouldn't ever work. It's, it's too fantastic to consider. You know what, Miss Vanderwig? I have an idea. We will jettison the ship. And we will get to Ganymede. Now, luckily, our saboteur friend hadn't bothered to rip up my charts. I spent half an hour feverishly thumbing through the volume devoted to asteroid orbits while Irma hovered over my shoulder and not daring to ask questions about, probably wondering just what in the blazes I was figuring out. Pretty soon, I had a list of a dozen likely asteroids. I narrowed it down to five, then to three, then to one. I missed the convenience of my computer, but... Yeah, regulations require a pilot to be able to get along without one in a pinch, and I got along. I computed a course toward the asteroid known as uh, 719 Albert. 
Luck was riding with us. 719 Albert was on the outward swing of his orbit. On the basis of some extremely rough computations, I worked out an orbit for our crippled ship that would match Albert's in a couple of hours. Finally, I looked up at Erna and grinned. This is known as making a virtue out of necessity. Want to know what's going on? You bet I do. I leaned back. We're on our way to a chunk of rock known as 719 Albert, which is um, chugging along not far from here in its way through the asteroid belt. 719 Albert is a rock about three miles in diameter. Figure that it's half the size of Deimos. And Deimos is about as small as a place could get, isn't it? But why are we going there? 719 Albert has an exceedingly eccentric orbit. And I mean eccentric in its astronomical sense. Uh, not a peculiar orbit, just one that's very highly elongated. At perihelion, Albert passes 20 million miles with, uh, from the orbit of Earth. At aphelion, which is where he's heading now, he comes within 90 million miles of the orbit of Jupiter. Unless my figures are completely cockeyed, Jupiter is going to be about 150 million miles from Albert about a week from now. I saw I'd lost her completely. She said dimly, Um, but you said a little while ago we hardly had enough fuel to take us 50 million miles. In the ship, yeah. But I've got other ideas. <clears throat> we'll land on Albert and we'll abandon the ship. Then we ride pickaback on the asteroid until it's closest to approach to Jupiter, and then we blast off without the ship. Blast off? How? I smiled triumphantly. We're going to make a raft out of your blessed logs, I said. We're going to attach one of the ship's rockets at the rear and shove off. Escape velocity from 719 Albert is so low it hardly matters. And since the mass of our raft will be only six or 700 pounds, Earth-side weight, of course, instead of the 30 tons or so this ship weighs, we'll be able to coast again and me with plenty of fuel to burn. She was looking at me as if I'd just delivered a lecture in the general theory of relativity, and apparently the niceties of space travel just weren't in her line at all. But she smiled and tried to look understanding. It, it sounds very clever, she said with an uncertain grin. And I did feel pretty clever about everything myself. Three hours later, when we landed on the surface of an asteroid that could only be 719 Albert, it had taken only one minor course correction to get us here, which meant my rule of thumb astrogation had been pretty damn good. We donned breathing suits. We clambered out of the ship to inspect our landfall. Uh, 719 Albert was not very impressive. The landscape was mostly jagged up thrust of a dark basalt-like rock. But the view was tremendous, a great brack backdrop of darkness speckled with stars and much closer to the orbiting fragments of other lumps of rock. Albert's horizon was on a foreshortened side, dipping away almost before it began. Gravitational attraction was so meager it hardly counted. A healthy jump was likely to continue indefinitely upward. As I made clear to Erna right at the start, I didn't want her indulging in the usual hijinks that greenhorns are fond of when they on a low-gravity planetoid such as this. I could visualize only too well the scene as she vanished into the void as the result of an overenthusiastic leap. We surveyed our holdings, and we found that there was enough food for two people for sixteen days, so we would make it with some despair. The air supply was less abundant, but there was enough, so we didn't need to begin worrying just yet. We set about building the graft. Erna dragged the logs out of the cabin. Their weight didn't mount anything here though I had to caution her about throwing them around carelessly. Mass and weight aren't not synonymous, and those logs were sturdy enough to knock me for a loop, regardless of how little they seemed to weigh. She fetched, and I assembled. We used the thirteen longest logs for the body of the raft. We trussed a couple across the bottom and a couple more at the top. To make blast off a little easier, we built the raft propped up against a rock outcropping at a 45-degree angle. I unshipped the smallest rocket engine, and I fastened it securely to the rear of the raft. I strapped down as many fuel tanks as the raft would hold, and then, chuckling to myself, I asked Erna to help me haul the cabin, the cannon, back out. The, the cannon, Sam? What for? We're going to mount the cannon at the front of the raft. <laughs> what, are you figuring on meeting some space pirates? I'm figuring on using the cannon as a brake. We fastened it to the front of the raft. We strapped down the supply of cannonballs and powder nearby it. The cannon would make an ideal brake. All we needed was something that would eject mass in a forwardly direction. Pushing us back by courtesy of Newton's third law. Why waste fuel when cannonballs would achieve the same purpose? It took us 48 standard Earth time hours to build a raft, and I don't know how many thousands of 719 Albert days that was. But the little asteroid spun in its axis like a yo-yo, and it seemed the sun was rising or setting every time we took a breath. 
After I had bound the last thong around the rocket engine, Erna grinned and dashed into the ship. She returned a few moments later, waving a red flag with some sort of blue and white design on it. What's that? The flag that flew over McIntyre's cabin. It's a rebel flag. We're not strictly insurrectionists, but we ought to have some kind of flag on our ship. I was agreeable. So she mounted the flag just for the rocket engine. Then we returned to the ship to wait. We waited for three days, Earth time, <laughs> which may be several centuries by 719 Albert Reckoning. And in case you're wondering how we passed the time on a barren homestead for three days, just one reasonably virile ferry pilot and one new bio museum curator, yeah, the answer is no, we did not. I have an inflexible rule about making passes at passengers, even when we're stranded on places like 719 Albert and when the passengers are as pretty as this one. That isn't to say I didn't feel temptation, and Erna's breathing suit was of the plastic kind that looked as though it was force molded to her body, you know. I didn't have to do much imagining. But I staunchly told Satan to get behind me, and to my own amazement, he did. I resisted temptation, and I resisted it manfully. Meanwhile, Jupiter swelled bigger and bigger as 719 Albert plunged madly along its track toward its rendezvous with Jove. If luck rode with us, translated if my math had been right, we would find Ganymede midway in her seven-plus day orbit around the big planet. Then came, time came when the mass detectors on my ship informed me that Jupiter had stopped getting closer and was now getting farther away. That meant that 719 Albert had passed its points of aphelion and was heading back toward Earth. It was time for us to get moving. All aboard, I told Erna. Make sure everything we're taking is strapped down tight. Food, fuel, air tanks, cannonballs, flags. She checked off as we were running down the meters and gauges at a spaceport. Food, fuel, air tanks, cannonballs, flag. <laughs> All set to blast, Captain. Okay, get yourself flattened out and hang on to the raft while we blast. Blast off was a joke. I computed the escape velocity of 719 Albert at approximately 0. 0.0015 miles per second. We could have shoved off with a good rearward kick, but we had fuel to burn. Alons! I cried, slamming the rocket engine into action. A burst of flame hurled us upward into the night. A la belle étoile! I shouted. To the stars! The raft soared off into space. Erna laughed with delight. As 719 Albert slowly sank into the sunset, we plunged forward toward the giant Jupiter. The only thing missing was soft music in the background. We rode the raft for three days at a constant acceleration. Jupiter grew and grew and grew, and the gleaming Ganymede became visible, peeking around the edge of the great planet. Erna became worried when she saw it. We're almost at the end. Hang out with us. Shouldn't we head the raft over toward Ganymede? She asked. We're, we're pointed much, we're much, pointed much too far forward, aren't we? Uh, we aren't going to reach Ganymede for another couple of days. We want to head for where Ganymede is going to be then, not where it happens to be right now. Oh, yeah, I suppose so. We were right on course. A few days later, we were heading downward toward the surface of Ganymede. It was like a riding a magic carpet. Controlled all. I controlled our landing with rockets while Erna gleefully fired ball after ball to provide the needed deceleration. If Ganymede had had an atmosphere, of course, we'd have been whiffed to cinders in a moment, but there was no atmosphere to contend with. We made a perfect no-point landing, flat on the glistening blue-white ice. Lord knows what we would have looked like approaching from space. We landed a hundred miles or so from the nearest entrance to the Ganymede Dome. I was downwardly considering the prospect of trekking on foot, but Erna was certain we had been seen, and sure enough, a snow crawler manned by three incredulous colonists came out to fetch us. I never saw human eyes bulge the way those six eyes bulge to the side of our raft. Part of the service I offer is guaranteed delivery, and so a couple of weeks later I rented a ship and made a return journey to 719 Albert to pick up the remaining historical relics we'd been forced to leave behind us. Some tattered uniforms, a few boxes of pamphlets. A week after that, a repair ship was dispatched to pick up my ferry, and she was hauled to the dockyard in Ganymede, and put back in operating condition at a trifling cost of a few thousand megabucks. These days, uh, yeah, these days I run a ferry service between the colonized moons of Jupiter and Saturn and earn as head curator of the Ganymede Museum. But I warn you, I don't take kindly toward getting employment because it means I have to spend time away from home and earn a, We were married a while back, you see. 
It's a funny thing about General McIntyre's log cabin. Despite Ernest's careful diagram, the cabin never got put back together. It seems the people of Ganymede decided it was of no great value to display the cabin of some Venusian rebel when they could be showing off an item of much more immediate associations for the Ganymedians. So they would not let Ernest take the raft apart, and I had to buy myself a new rocket engine. Yep, you can still see the raft in the Museum of Ganymede anytime you happen to be in the neighborhood. If the curator's around, she won't mind answering questions. Yeah, but don't you try getting playful with her. I'm awfully touchy about guys who make passes on my wife. So that one is delivery guaranteed. So thanks everybody for sticking around a few extra minutes. I hope you enjoyed. Um, so if you're watching on YouTube, thank you for joining us. Well, we got a bunch of people out there. Well, thanks guys for joining us on YouTube. We're gonna signing off and now in three, two, one. Blast off.